Right, it's time now to check in with what's happening in our regions and to do that we are joined in the studio by Ollie Lalive, who's the founder of the Humans of Agriculture podcast which tells the story of those people living on the land. Ollie, it's wonderful to have you in the studio. I know you travel you a lot around the country so it's nice to have you here in yeah. person. I know, I thought it'd be good just to come in and see what you guys are up to yeah. so it's great to be here. So good. Great. Now as we know, um, foot and mouth disease is a huge concern particularly for the agriculture sector. As you've been travelling around, what have people been saying to you about that? I think, like rightly, people are really concerned, and there's a lot of anxiety mm -hmm. around it, Joe. But, um, like, I, I guess we took the chance to make sure we're chatting with the experts in the field, and I think we're lucky in Australia that they're the people that we've got here. We've got the best in the world, the brightest minds working on it, and it's not an issue that has just popped up over the last few months or few weeks. It's something that Australia have been working on for decades to keep out. Our expert, exports are underpinned by um, our ability to provide assurance to our customers. So I think for us the, the assurance we can take is there's a plan in place, it's very well rehearsed, it's sophisticated and um, that, yeah, I, I guess people that can, can uh, yeah, take that um, th there is, yeah, the, we've got a, a plan in place yeah. and um, off the back of that some of that anxiety can hopefully look at just instilling calm. Mm. I mean listen mm. if this disease like goes right across the agriculture industry we are we have a lot to answer for don't we there is a message though you know for Australians to be careful to really look after your footwear you know where you've been um, especially when you come back into Australia do you think that message is getting through do you think people are mm. taking heed? Well, I think that it's definitely front of mind and, and the messages are getting out there across all forms of media. And I think the important part of this is that everyone has a role to play, whether you're a traveller coming back from a holiday, wherever that might be, across Asia, where the disease could be present, but also inside the farm gate. And I think reassuringly, after being out and about and catching up with people everywhere, we're actually seeing a, a refreshed plan and people are actually bringing it front of mind. So I think that's, yeah, mm. it, it, it is, there, there is concern but I think we're actually using it as a really good opportunity to freshen up our thinking around some of these issues. Yeah. Now, as you've been travelling around, people have been telling you that climate change is a, a massive concern mm. for them. Obviously, that's the same with um, so many people across the country. But there's not as much awareness around the sustainability measures that are actually already being undertaken by people um, in agriculture. Yeah, so I think like over the last few weeks, Joe, um, I continually get mind blown with the people I'm chatting to, yeah. and mm -hmm. and I think one thing which so climate change is the number one priority for the Australian public based off the report by the Bravery, and off the back of that, um, in agriculture, we've got incredible businesses that are, are, are front of mind in this. I think what people may forget that farmers are on the front line of it, and so constantly season to season variation. People are adapting um, on the land. But then we've got these incredible innovations. So this week I caught up with um, Ben Barlow from New Edge Microbials. And they're, I'll say a small business, but they're based in Albury and they're, they're playing globally. And basically what they're doing is putting a microbe on seeds which will increase, improve soil health um, and, and in, improve the productivity of the country which people are farming. So I think um, the message which isn't getting out around agriculture is that um, there is so much happening kind of behind the scenes and I think um, through humans of agriculture but also us as an industry that's that's the part which we actually we're, we're probably missing that opportunity at the moment. Mm. Now Ollie we were talking about how you've been on the road and you've uh, been traveling quite a bit one of the places you visited was Batuta now I had to look <laughs> up Batuta on a map which I did and then I wikipedia it and it says Batuta is a ghost town within the locality of Birdsville a ghost town? It exists. It yeah. does. Yeah. <laughs> and apparently, we read that the last um, living permanent resident they died in 2004. Yeah. So what what happens to the what? town now? Well, there was definitely people there, and, oh, and the pub's actually reopened. So okay, good. Um, yeah, we actually stayed at a little station called Mount Leonard. Do you mean Wikipedia was wrong? Yeah. Well, it might need to be updated. Oh, yeah, I think yeah, so. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah. we met um, a travelling vet there. So he oh, flies wow. around Australia. Um, right across kind of the top end and mm. yeah like I'd never been to that part of Australia and it's yeah. mind-blowingly beautiful so and the roads I tell you they're incredible oh, there, right. so yeah. put it on your on your map okay. yeah, yeah, absolutely. yeah and what what does the traveling vet do exactly because of course we know how important animals are yeah. to farmers and to people living on the land from you know cattle and and livestock but also working dogs and other animals as well 
Yeah, so I think um, Dr. Cosy, Campbell Costello, I think he's a bit of a mixture of maybe like Dr. Chris Brown, Steve Irwin and maybe Maverick, I think. Oh, is probably okay. how you bring the blend <laughs> together. Um, and so, yeah, he drops in on stations, does kind of routine checkups, but then also emergency procedures as needed. And part of his job, which was fascinating, was actually working with the Indigenous communities. Mm. So he uh, flies around w with his dog um, and, and drops in on different properties, different communities. and what a great job. Oh, it's that incredible. sounds like a TV show as well. Yeah. It should be, yeah. yeah. I so. <laughs> Ollie, it's wonderful to have you in the studio. Thank you so much for coming in this morning. Thanks for having me. Good to see you. Let's now return to Dan Borshaw, who's standing by at the Gama Festival for Weekend Breakfast. Dan, we've been talking about this expected speech by the Prime Minister on the draft question for a referendum to create an Indigenous voice to Parliament. Obviously, there must be a lot of buzz there at the festival. Oh, there certainly is, Valzia. Good morning to you. It's good to be back here from this special land of uh, the Gumach people of the Yulu tribe of this part of Arnhem Land who have generously welcomed us all onto their land to help facilitate these big conversations to share their culture story through dance, singing, discussions with everyone here, Indigenous leaders from around the nation, as well as a number of business leaders, politicians as well. The Prime Minister arrived yesterday with that fanfare around the cultural performance where he was invited in and given that very special gift and that's ahead of t today's speech where we are expecting the Prime Minister to detail what is the sequence of words that the government would like to put to the Australian people in a referendum and what would be the wording that would go into the Constitution. That'll be coming up soon. This morning we've been hearing from uh, in immediate initial reaction from some of those people that have been involved, the non-government sector, business. Unions have been a big part of this discussion and will be into the future as well. Thomas Mayer is the National Indigenous Officer at the Maritime Union of Australia and joins me now. Good morning, great to have you along. Yeah, pleasure to be here with you, Dan. Hey, you've had a really long connection with the Uluru State, and I want to get to that in a moment, but firstly, how does it feel to be back here on country, on uh, Yolu country? Oh, it's such a beautiful place, a very special place. You feel, you know, the spirituality of, of uh, the people and this long connection to country here. And it's where, you know, it's like where big decisions are made, big uh, announcements are made. So it's really exciting. We are expecting a big announcement today. The, the Prime Minister has spoken about Indigenous advancement in that first speech when he won the election. In, in every speech since, he talks about it being about manners, about having manners to include, listen and hear First Nations perspectives. What's your initial reaction to what we've seen in print that will likely be what the Prime Minister delivers in a couple of hours? Oh, I think it's great. You know, It just shows that it's a, it is a Prime Minister that's listening to us. Um, you know, and which is what the Australian people want a Prime Minister to do, I think. And uh, I think, uh, you know, this is an important piece of detail there for people to know. You know, lots of people are talking about the Uluru Statement and the voice since, uh, you know, since the big announcement that, that delivered in full in government in, in this term of parliament. And it's just one of those very important steps towards winning a referendum. And I want to get to your involvement in the Uluru Statement process in a moment. But the wording that we've already seen, there's been discussion about whether mm. it goes far enough, perhaps not in some people's view, perhaps in others, not far enough or too far, in fact. What do you make of, of that, of, of the kind of initial discussions? Well, I think if those, uh, you know, those different ends of the political spectrum are having this debate, uh, and that's a good thing in, in the sense that we, we've captured the middle. You know, uh, we, we will have um, a great majority of Australian people um, voting yes, I think, you know. Uh, you, the, the nature of consensus, just like the Uluru Statement itself, you know, Indigenous people have different views uh, and opinions from our different experiences and our different political ideologies. Um, but the nature of consensus is that it's never everything that everybody wants. And so I think the balance is right with, uh, you know, what we're hoping the question will be. In that sense, perhaps everyone making some concessions. You were on the road travelling around the country. You've written a number of books that you've got been acclaimed for. In having this conversation about capturing that middle, if I can borrow your term, tell me about that process. What did you learn about Australia? Yeah, I learned, well, there's, there's many different ways that people understand things, you know, but I... I think what I've really learned is that Australians um, really are uh, generous people, you know, um, they do believe in a fair go. 
Uh, they just need that opportunity and the information to be able to make uh, the political decisions to see that become a reality. Um, it's certainly not a fair go for Indigenous people. Decisions are made about us all the time. Um, without our, our involvement, without um, us having a representative body to coherently put our views across and make sure that they make the right decisions in Parliament. And that's the big change that we're talking about here. Not only, you know, accepting this culture, um, this, the, you know, the longest continuing culture on the planet um, as, as part of who we are in our DNA, the Constitution, the rule book of the nation, but also starting to get those things right. Um, it's, it's the key thing that we need. Um, the power to influence the decisions that are made about us to close the gap. We've, we've already heard uh, some criticism of the process. Jacinta Price, the new CLP Senator for the Northern Territory, has said she's worried that it lacks the substance to be able to create change. She wants to know exactly wh what it's going to do and how it's going to do that. What do you say to, when you hear that? Well, it's, it's just democracy, um, you know, how democracy works. That in a democracy, a, 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 you know, a group of people, whether it's an electorate or a people that have been connected to this country for 60,000 years, um, they, they need the ability to influence, to have representation, to influence decisions that are made. It really is the most practical reform that we can, that we can do for First Nations people, uh, is give us a voice to make sure that, you know, we are able to, to influence the decisions that are made. Uh, I, think, I think her concerns are valid that this isn't something symbolic. Um, but what we're talking about here with the Uluru Statement, I hope she, she begins to grasp, is, is really um, is the most practical thing we can do. Because the decisions that she's part of making representing the Northern Territory, not Indigenous people, in, um, in Canberra, um, influence housing, influence the justice system, influence the way that money is spent in our communities, all these things that, um, that, that are so important to us. Mm. You've spoken about the Uluru Statement being an invitation. Other Indigenous Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander leaders have done the same. Mm. What do you say this morning, Thomas, to Australians that might be watching that, that don't understand or don't know where it fits in and perhaps don't feel that it might be a part of their life as well? Well, this, like being here at Gama, you know, you, as you know, you just feel the generosity, the, you know, the welcome uh, of, of the people. Um, a lot of Australians haven't interacted with Indigenous people, but this is who we are, this is our culture. This is what will be um, accepted when they accept this gift. And, um, you know, Australia has so much to gain from having our knowledge, our culture, uh, you know, our wisdom, our experience, participating in democracy um, with a constitutional right to always do so. There's everything to gain and there's nothing to lose from that. And, and you know, that goes across so many issues. You know, our voice in the centre of decision making about climate change, about how we look after our environment is really important, about how we look after each other, you know, how we, you know, have more of a caring and, uh, you know, bringing the, the weakest along with us. This is what we'd bring to Parliament. Yeah, I think you captured in that sense about the generosity. That's generosity from Indigenous leaders to all Australians. Thomas Mayer, thank you so much. Always great to yard. Thank you, Dan. And you heard there about that being the, the goodwill that has come to this point. That's really the goodwill that is going to need to be a part of this conversation going forward from all Australians about having difficult conversations that are respectful and bring people together. That uh, the, the point there that Thomas was making about it not being about um, everyone winning, that there will be concessions along the way. I mean, that's democracy, isn't it? It's, it's a, a fascinating point that we've just heard this morning here at the Gama Festival, uh, and we're going to be bringing you more reaction right across this weekend. So many significant conversations, so many significant yarnings. Thank you so much, Dan. Dan Borsha there, talking to us from the Gama Festival there, Narnam Lan. Now, discussions around the role of women in the Catholic Church in Australia have ramped up in recent weeks. It was first sparked by a major decision making event calling called the Plenary Council, which was suspended after two motions affirming the equal dignity of women and